Madam State Manager, how are you today? I'm fine, and you? Doing well, doing well. Good, I hope you all are. Would you like an invocation, Mr. Mayor? Please. Richard, you want, you want to lead us? I thought, I thought Ms. Wilson was going to do that. I'll, I'm going to defer I, to you today. I, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, Lord, special for this day and for all that you've done for us, for all of the special and many needs in our area and in our community, we simply ask that, that you would touch us, sensitize us to the various issues, the conversation around this table and in this room, we pray that thou would give us open ears and receptive hearts. We ask it in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Reverend Mendel. Get the ushers come forward, please. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, we will open our city council discussion with an affordable housing initiative presentation by Ms. Gloria Saeed, Community Development Director. And I will say that all of our development departments who report to Assistant City Manager Gentry have had a part in this presentation. I think Gloria probably has had a big, biggest part, or and Krista and everyone else, uh, she's doing the honors, but all of them have worked as a team to come up with some of the recommendations that we'll make. And I'm very glad to say, while I have the opportunity, I see so many of our banking partners in the room. Um, that's going to be key to any of the recommendations being implemented. So I really want to say thank you from me for their willingness to listen. Gloria? Or Krista? <laughs> so, see, I told you Krista helped in our Planning and Development Services Director. Thank you. I, good afternoon, everyone. I have a small speaking part this afternoon. Um, I have the pleasure of teeing this up um, for the star of the show, my fabulous colleague here, Ms. Gloria Saeed. Um, but what I want get to talk to you about is the alignment with Envision Columbia. And while it could be argued that affordable workforce housing, safe, decent housing for everybody, underpins all of your goals and focus areas, there's just a couple we want to make sure you're aware of. Um, first of all, empowering our residents. Um, you remember it says our citizens live in a safe, sustainable neighborhood where children are thriving, learning, and having fun, financially and physically healthy, and lead peaceful and productive lives. Um, enhancing Columbia's neighborhoods, obviously, if we have a good diverse supply of affordable workforce and a variety of housing choices, that helps support that focus area. And two goals to, be, to remind yourself of is connecting the city's neighborhoods and business districts through cohesive land use, infrastructure development, and transportation planning. We're going to be looking at housing a lot in our upcoming comprehensive plan. And goal number three, fostering a healthy quality of life, focusing on safety, culture, and recreation. So what we're talking about here ties right into everything you've been working on for the past year. I'll turn it over to Gloria. Thank you, Krista. Good afternoon, Mayor Benjamin, members of City Council, Ms. Wilson. Um, it's my pleasure today to uh, present to you our uh, how Envision Housing uh, presentation as it relates to uh, the needs that we are currently seeing around Columbia. Um, as you know, we are in the process uh, uh, or in the middle of our uh, two-year uh, plan that was put forth by uh, Ms. Wilson. So we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what we've done in the past, what, what we've done very well, um, where we are now, and then we'll present some things for discussion toward the end of the presentation. So as you all know, uh, the City of Columbia is a uh, participating jurisdiction, it's a PJ, and we do receive entitlement dollars on an annual basis uh, from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And HUD mandates that we uh, prepare a, a five-year consolidated plan. And in this plan, it helps us to uh, recognize and understand what the community needs are, uh, helps us to uh, see what they're interested in, um, how to set priorities and objectives as we move forward and make plans to spend those dollars. And more imp most importantly with those federal dollars, we are asked to assist those who are low to moderate income individuals. So a lot of the planning that we do is centered around that. So um, just to give you a little bit of information, between 2000 and 2013, the ho medium home prices increased by 69 percent and rents have increased by 49%. And our consolidated plan also said that 3,860 homeowners and 11,069 renters 
are paying more than 30% of their income toward housing costs. And before coming in today, I called my friend, Ms. Nancy Stoudemire with the Columbia Housing Authority just to get some more updated statistics about how we look in terms of housing affordability in the Columbia area. And I do want to share a little bit of that information with you that's not on the slides. So <clears throat> CHA has said that in uh, July of 2016, their Section 8 program that was closed for three years um, was reopened, and they accepted 23,266 applications in 27 hours. And of the, pardon me? 27 hours? In 27 hours, yes. And of those, they um, randomly selected 3,000 of them for uh, assistance. In addition, as of January 1st, 2018, just a few weeks ago, there are still 2,500 applicants on that Section 8 wait list. In May of 2016, the Columbia Housing Authority opened up its Housing Choice Voucher Project-Based Program and there are still 8,500 people on that waiting list. So the public housing wait list opened in August of 2017. So I'm, these are three different programs. And as of December 31st, last year, there were 10,000 applicants on that wait list. So needless to say, <coughs> needless to say, the affordable housing situation hadn't gotten any better. It's actually gotten worse. So I think that's really important to, to, to point out. So, Gloria, I was trying to write those down, but just so we know total. So Section 8 wait list currently has 20,000? 2,500. 20, oh, 2,500. Okay. Correct. Section 8. Section 8. Correct. Correct. And then the public housing is 10,000? Yes. Section 8, 2,500. Section 8, 2,500. 2,500. And the housing choice voucher has 8,500? And the uh, public housing, housing has 10,000. So that's probably about, that, I did math, about 20,000 people who still need housing currently. Could somebody be on all three years? Um, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. And when the um, housing authority opens up that list, it gets ah. increased from all around the country as well. So it's not just limited to local. Yeah. Yeah. But all right, that's a good point. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, that's a good point right. because I was... You say it's not local? Not not all, but that was, way yeah. list may very well be. But, right. but, but those, those large numbers come from all across the, all the country. Because they hear that we have an opening and they send the application to Columbia Housing. Uh, they it's might a, it's an online process. It's an online process. Mm -hmm. an online process. But, 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 but that, even that being said, those numbers are all across Basically the country. Local. Basically local. Yeah. High numbers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, 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 that, but that number always shocks the conscience. It does. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, but typically our vouchers or whatever CHA has to utilize, they focus on the local area first. Correct. Well, so the 10, sorry, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Let me just read you. The 10,000, the 10,000 number that sort of delineates public housing, that's nationwide? No, that's local. Oh, that's that's local. That's yes, local. Yes, local. Authority. <coughs> Statistics. Yeah. One of the programs that they have. Those are for like your Allen Benedict Allen Court. Benedict, yeah. It's for um, like Oak Reed and Marion Street High Rise. Okay, all right. All right. Those types of um, project-based So um, what is affordable housing? A lot of people throw that term, throws that term around pretty loosely, but um, and I guess it depends on what uh, position or what the topic is at the time of the conversation. Because affordable housing to you, Mayor Benjamin, may mean something different to me. Um, it's based on whatever you're paying. If you're able to pay it, then it's affordable to you. But for the purposes of this conversation, we're going to use the U.S. government definition of affordable housing. And it's basically those who pay 30% or less, and I'm paraphrasing, for their housing expense. If they're paying 30% or less, then they are paying uh, housing costs that are affordable. However, <coughs> if they're paying more than 30%, they're considered cost burden. 
And for an example, uh, if you're making $2,000 a month and you're paying more than $600 for rent or for a mortgage, then you're considered cost burdened and so forth. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we talked about that particular definition. So who needs affordable housing? Some of the professions that can benefit from affordable housing includes uh, police officers, firefighters, school teachers, nurses, disabled persons, administrative workers, and hospitality workers. And that's just some of the professions. Um, many of them who are government employees who actually work for municipalities such as the City of Columbia. And so we know that there's a huge need for affordable housing. Um, and, but then there's a stigma that goes along with it, as though you know, if, if you have a need for afford affordable housing, you're in some type of category where you know, it may not be acceptable for you uh, or for people to accept you in terms of living in their neighborhoods. So um, <clears throat> most of the people um, in these professions as well can generally earn between thirty-two dollars to $55,000 So improving quality of life. I want to talk a little bit about how we're currently um, using or viewing uh, the federal funding and other funding uh, to help with improving the quality of life. And that means providing housing for everybody. So in terms of the federal dollars, uh, those dollars are meant to assist people who are 80% or below the area median income. And that's what we currently do, and I think we do a very good job at that, um, which you'll see as we get further along in the slides in terms of how we're spending those dollars. But we also have people who uh, have the need for housing that exceed 80%. So what do we do with them? Uh, those are the folk that we say uh, we need to provide workforce housing for them. They make over 80 uh, percent of the area AMI, but they also have needs for housing and um, are interested in um, the same quality, uh, affordable, safe, sanitary housing that anyone else would want. Also, we utilize general fund dollars to produce housing uh, for individuals with incomes that exceed 120 percent of the AMI. And I think this is really important because as we are moving forward with the uh, envision uh, Columbia over the next uh, 20 years, we want to make sure that we have a very diverse community. And in order to do that, we need to be able to serve all the various income uh, brackets that we're discussing. And, and I should know this because my husband tells me that all the time, but I can't remember. What is what's the standard that your housing shouldn't exceed? What percentage of your income? 30. 30? 30%. So here are our income limits. This is, uh, this is the chart that we use. The, uh, HUD issues this, out, uh, issues, this, issues this chart on an annual basis. Uh, usually it comes out somewhere around April. Um, and it's the uh, metro, Metropolitan Statistical Area um, Income for uh, Richland County. And this is what we use. And I've highlighted the 80% uh, line item just so that you can see what those incomes are. For a one-person household, they can make $37,550 or less and qualify for uh, uh, the majority of the housing programs that we offer. However, there are still people who make 50% and 30% of the AMI that need housing. And we can talk a little bit about what uh, sources are available out there to help serve that population as well. And uh, further, as I mentioned, uh, the workforce housing, those people would be at 81% up to 119%, uh, and I'm just sort of breaking it down. That's the definition. Usually workforce housing is those individuals who earn 81% up to 120% of the AMI. So, so you've got two categories that so far, those below 80 and those from 80 up to 120. Lori, the uh, one 
two, three, and off the top, is that income earners or number, number of individuals? Number, individuals. Number, people. Number, number, uh, number that's household. number per household. Yeah. Just number of people. Per household, correct. So if you have a one-person household, they uh, can make 37550 or less and qualify for the majority of our housing programs that we offer. But the good thing about it, because of our general fund dollars, um, of course, we, we can assist the workforce housing not as much as we would like, but we also can help those in higher income. Um, that's one of the benefits that uh, the city employees get to enjoy uh, through our general uh, fund dollars, uh, that they uh, have access to those funds as well so that they can reside in the city limits of Columbia. So I think we do a very good job in trying to diversify the funds that we do have. We just need more of it. So <clears throat> in, in your packets, you have um, a list that looks like this. Um, and it can give you a breakdown if you care to, to look at it at your leisure. Uh, we're showing on this chart what monies we have spent over the past five years toward um, uh, with uh, CDBG home and general fund dollars. We've shown what we've spent, and then we're also showing what we leveraged. And uh, as you can see, over the five-year period between 2012 and 2016, we spent over, we spent $7 million, and based on that, we were able to leverage $14.3 million. So that was uh, through a lot of uh, great planning and efforts. Uh, that we were able to leverage the dollars to that extent. Now, we took information from that prior list and uh, disaggregated those programs or projects that were uh, related to our housing loans. So you can see that with our CDBG funding source, over the past five years, we have made 40 loans totaling $1.4 million. Um, that's the City Lens 1 affordable housing loan, uh, the MAP loan, employee loans, and also uh, we provided a program that we no longer offer today uh, for GAP for uh, purchase rehab. And maybe that's something we can talk about later as well. Um, what, that, yes, sir. I, I was just asking, um, what, why... Um, why are we no longer participating in With the GAP purchase, purchase rehab? rehab. <clears throat> um, from my understanding, that was a program that was uh, designed and uh, in partnership with the Federal Home Loan Bank several years ago. And then once the funds were all uh, allocated, then we just didn't do the program again. Uh, but these programs are very popular. Um, no, we did include, Gloria, the, <coughs> excuse me, we did include the MAP program at one point a year or two ago. There was the program sort of fizzled out. We still, we still offer the MAP program. Okay. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, still we still there. fund that. Yes. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, with our home dollars, We've done uh, 37 loans and uh, funded the city lender, one, and affordable housing loans, and uh, spent $2.7 million. And with general fund dollars, as you can see, that's uh, the program that we've done the most loans in, um, and there's probably a reason for that. Um, we've done 98 and spent $2.8 million. So theoretically, you would think that usually if there's someone in, in uh, the higher income bracket where uh, they're using the, the general fund dollars for your city lender two or employee loans, that uh, their incomes are higher and probably um, in a better position to uh, you know, pay their bills on time and don't have as many distractions that could um, affect you know, how they decide to prioritize um, their needs in terms of family and things that might come up suddenly. City lender two mean we in the second position on the loan? In a bank first position, the second position? Second city 
No, sir, it's actually based on income. Okay. Just a second. So if they make over 80%, that chart we, sh we showed you earlier, then they'll qualify for a CD lender student loan. Yeah, typically, typically, Gloria, our banking partners are in first position. Correct. Now, with the affordable housing loan, we do 100% of that right. with a small, down, a small down payment of $500. So, um, future funding. This is where we are now. Um, as you know, council, you all. Um, approved a two-year funding plan for our CDBG entitlement dollars. And uh, you ask that we prioritize those dollars uh, in uh, four targeted areas of the city. Um, and uh, we've done that. And in this current year, we have allocated $706,000 uh, for acquisition, demolition, and relocation uh, to our development corporations, the facade, we allocated $140,734. And also, there's an infrastructure improvement uh, project that we funded for $110,750. The uh, acquisition, demolition, and relocation is occurring in the Book of Washington Heights and uh, King Lion communities. And the facade is along the uh, Farrell Road, Beltline, Business Corridor, and the infrastructure approve, improvement is in the Edisto Heights community. It's a total of 957000 that we've allocated in CDBG dollars for this current fiscal year, which is part of our two-year plan, so we're, we're on target. We want to stay on target. Um, here, and I'm just going to run through these really quickly. Um, these are some of the maps for our prioritized targeted areas. Of course, I mentioned Booker Washington Heights, uh, the Eau Claire Fair Road Business Corridor, the uh, Edisto Court neighborhood. Those are the boundaries for that area, and the King Lion. So, so what are the? <clears throat> could you go back to the uh, Booker Washington area, please? What are the, what are the boundaries? I can't see the boundary line. Um, um, it goes. So that's Farrell. Man, glass. Yeah, that's Farrell. Oh, that's Farrell. Oh, that's Farrell. Oh, that's Farrell. Oh, that's really blowing it up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Go back to uh, Book of Washington. <laughs> Swipe it. click it. Swipe it. Can you see okay. that? Okay. I'm trying to look and see what that so if is. We, if well, we started on. There you go. Give me the boundaries, Gloria. So I know it's along Farrell Road yeah. and Beltline Boulevard. Yeah. And 277. Beltline, Farrell Road, 277. Mm -hmm. We're going to have larger maps. Yeah. Is that what we're here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I didn't prepare for that question. Okay. okay um, just briefly, we wanted to highlight some of the projects that we've successfully completed that's in the past. Um, of course, you all may remember um, uh, Arbor Hill, that groundbreaking uh, took place in two 2005. Um, where there were some uh, apartments there, some were burned out, they were just in a deplorable condition, and those were raised, and uh, TN Development Corporation came back with 30 townhomes. And um, there's uh, layered funding, private dollars, and also home dollars to construct that property. Um, in addition, uh, Waters Crest Apartments, uh, that groundbreaking uh, took place in recent years, um, and there, there are eight units there. And uh, people seem to like that because of the density. Mm -hmm. I, guess. I, I like that. Yes. That, that um, I think, would be uh, another version of uh, infill housing. You can go in and it's, um, there's, a high, it's, it's good, there's a good chance that it blends <coughs> uh, low maintenance overall. And that's always nice. 
it works better when there's smaller units spread around than there has been where we we try to do these large right and projects. i think a lot of that's going to depend on where it is like yes yeah. yeah, in the uh, a neighborhood setting as opposed to a large business corridor area where you could probably do a higher density um, and then we also included uh, Patterson Road apartments. So as you can see, we have a wide variety of uh, styles and a uh, number of units that have been uh, produced uh, uh, over the years. Um, this is Burton Heights. Um, you all may be familiar with this uh, neighborhood as well, uh, off of uh, Farrell Road, and there were 26 homes built there. And you can see what that average square footage was on those houses. Um, also, these houses were recently, uh, in recent years, completed, and these are in the Lion Street community. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I thought I had some notes on that. But to add to, to this, um, I do know that the Columbia Housing Development Corporation um, over the last 15 years uh, added, um, I would say probably about 12 houses in this, in this neighborhood. And um, they had uh, acquired some lots which were later sold to the Housing Authority and the Housing Authority has uh, constructed on those lots. So you're looking at about 20 new houses um, that, has, that has begun to, to reshape this neighborhood. Um, and there's more to come because you know that the Gonzalez Gardens apartments have been uh, demolished recently too. Um, and that funding that was used uh, was money that was received by the City of Columbia through community development uh, NIP funds. So just goes to show a little bit of how you um, have to uh, access various dollars out there to help achieve whatever it is that you're doing um, towards uh, revitalizing uh, neighborhoods. So some of the proposed projects that are currently on the table, and um, if you all have questions, um, the executive directors for the development corporations can certainly add to what is not here that you may be interested in knowing. Um, but you know, there's the uh, Pinehurst uh, project, uh, which is off Pinehurst and Forest Drive, right across from Pinehurst Park. And uh, there are 52 senior units that are proposed for that property um, that's current, currently under the, in, in planning, I'll put it to you that way. It will be an $8 million investment, and there's a $1.2 million gap. Uh, other proposed projects include the South Edisto neighborhood, and uh, it's a $3.5 million uh, investment with a $842,000 gap, <clears throat> and the the gap funding sources uh, that are currently under consideration um, are home investment partnership dollars through the City of Columbia and uh, Richland County. And also, um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there's $110,000 that has been allocated to the CDC for some infrastructure work to complement this development in this current year. Is that It's under consideration for funding. And the, um, and that says how many units? Um, it's 20 single family housing units, and it, yeah. it will be mixed income, and it would be uh, for home ownership and for uh, rental. All right, and Pinehurst was at 40? 52 uh, units 52, 52, 52 at Pinehurst. 52. 52. And those are all um, rental units for seniors. And the veranda, you all may have invitations in front of you for this groundbreaking. <laughs> um, it's also one of the uh, proposed, well, one of the projects that are currently, uh, that is currently underway. Um, there is still a gap of uh, one to $1.4 million. Um, and some of the potential funding sources would be home and, of course, our CDBG-DR. Um, the current funding look, 
the bulk of the funding came through LITEC, LITEC dollars through SC Housing or the tax credit. <coughs> So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, partnerships and collaborations. We, 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 can't, we can't do the work that, that we need to do without partnerships and, and, and collaborations. Um, some of the partners that we've had uh, in the past, of course, include our nonprofit housing development corporations, SC Housing, um, the Columbia Housing Authority, of course, HUD, um, and you know, they, they've done a great job with providing um, both rental housing and housing for uh, home ownership, multifamily and single family uh, in the city of Columbia. But we need to do a lot more. Um, I think one of the areas uh, that we need to focus on as we continue to move forward is building additional partnerships with banks, CDFIs, <laughs> and affordable housing lenders. There, there are uh, partners out there who want to help us do what we need to do. You know, the city serves as a conduit. Um, we, provide gap, <clears throat> we provide gap funding, and I know some of my um, team members probably get tired of me saying that, but, but we're the gap. And uh, we know we need to produce more housing, so we need those partnerships to be strengthened with our, our banks and our affordable nonprofits uh, like the LISC. Uh, or the federal home loan banks uh, who can help with financing affordable housing projects. So what, we sh what, what, what do we do next? Uh, we propose convening a meeting uh, with select lenders. And when I say select, select lenders, those who are really interested in assisting uh, us with the uh, meeting our affordable housing goals, and um, those could be CDFIs, uh, syndicators, they can be private developers, nonprofit corporations, for-profit developers, but they must have an interest in affordable housing because we know that we, we need that. In addition to that, we also need those private dollars that can help us um, also include market rate housing in our developments. You know, we've been talking about uh, mixed income housing. Um, I, I think it would be to our benefit as we continue to plan and, and move forward that we look at uh, any of the housing that we develop in the future as being mixed, mixed income to the greatest extent possible. Um, that's how you're going to change, help change your neighborhoods in a, in a, in a way that uh, can make uh, economic sense um, in the long haul. So before having this meeting, though, um, we need to make sure that we We've got our stuff together, that we have a, 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 a presentation so that when we do have those banker, bankers, uh, lenders in the room, they know what direction we're headed in and they know uh, what our needs are and they can go back to their sp respective areas and come back with, with uh, uh, opportunities for us to, to explore. Yes, this will be challenging, um, but I know that there are other, uh, uh, other municipalities and governmental uh, entities around the country who, who are making it happen through a lot of creativity. Um, I know you've heard that old adage, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. So we really need to step out and think outside of the box where we um, can build those partnerships with others who can help us. Um, we are now in, as I said, the first year of our two-year uh, uh, work plan. And we have development corporations who are identifying um, properties to purchase. We're doing acquisition and demolition. And um, those, those properties will need to be developed. You know, the federal dollars, they're great, but they do have strings attached. And what uh, those strings, some of what it includes is that when we're using our federal dollars, particularly CDBG, um, those projects need to be underway in three to five years. So we can't do land banking. We have to be very diligent in terms of the properties that we're actually acquiring that we have plans in the very near future to develop 
uh, these uh, revitalize these neighborhoods. And we also need to identify what city resources will be available. And so that's where you council come into play and in helping to identify other resources um, and to give us a direction and clarity on how we can uh, make these uh, projects work. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry, let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. um, when we look at the partners, are we looking at strengthening the existing partners and the development of new partnerships within the uh, within this whole fabric of things? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, we ask. We are. Yes. yes, sir. That's very important. Um, we we've already started some conversations with uh, partners. Some of them are here in the room today. Our banking partners, raise your hands. Our CDFIs, our developers, raise your hands. <laughs> yes. Big so they're, Big they're very interested. So, I guess my, my point is, it, of course, we are grateful for partners and whether or not that relationship is going to continue to strengthen itself. And, of course, look at additional partners who will sort of pile on and create a kind of uh, expansion of what we're trying to do. So yes, okay, all right. Do any of these future funding sources fit squarely into some of the funding gaps we have? I mean, will they will we be able to move forward with Pinehurst and or Rosewood with, with some of these fundings or are these different projects focused? Well, no, the, these, yet to answer your question, yes, they could, um, and I know people get tired of hearing me say this too, but there is a process. Um, but uh, these funds would, would be available, particularly the CDBG funding. We already know that we have that available. We have, we have not allocated that to any project yet, uh, but we will be doing that in the near future. What we're saying here is with our CDBG revolving loan fund, um, if council so desires, you know, we could propose setting aside $250,000 annually uh, to um, assist with funding projects uh, to help with redevelopment. Would that 250 be for acquisition, demolition, and gap funding? It could be. We would look at it on. All projects on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but yes, those are some of the criteria that um, we would look for in terms of uh, considering the project for funding. Yes, so Gloria, you're looking at this would be a different pot of money, and then then the CD, CBDOs would go through an application process like they currently do for other CDBG or home or right. funding, like they currently do for our NOFA. And the CDBO would need to be, got, you'll have guidelines that you'll put out and will educate the development community about what they need to do ahead of time yes. to qualify. Correct. To, to, get that to get that designation. Correct. Um, and if, if there's an organization, because we all, we, the City of Columbia's Community Development Department <clears throat> also funds CHOTOs. That's the designation for the uh, builders or nonprofits who apply for home dollars. So if they have a CHOTO designation, they will automatically qualify as a CDO because the requirements are pretty much the same. So we're proposing, should council desire, um, we usually receive anywhere between 650 to 800,000 dollars a year in revolving loan funds um, but do remember that these funds this is what we use to to provide loans to people um, at the low interest rate this, these are the funds we use for home ownership so if we're going to set aside money for that that means we're going to have less for home ownership I'm not saying that that's a bad thing per se um, it could be that we'll do this for a certain number of years um, until we achieve those numbers that we need to achieve, um, or, uh, you know, you, you do it in perpetuity. It just depends. 
but the importance of the leveraging if we were, if council were to move forward with doing something like bullet one for example obviously the 250,000 will go but so far so if you've got a CDBO um, designated developer the importance of these conversations with our banking partners becomes even more real because you want to then drive them hopefully to other institutions that could um, complement maybe what the city is doing is that the idea yes and and to uh, to add to that um, it really goes without saying the importance of planning ahead mm -hmm. um, because we we don't fund ideas we fund projects so if we're going to do this, we really need to put forth a deliberate effort in identifying projects that we can utilize the funds for. Because we know that can be risky. If you've got funds and you're not using, right. you know, that, that adds to some additional things that could happen. So, so the projects in our targeted areas, and I know you all touched upon those on the slides for you, but those are some of the projects, too, that have the potential to be expanded upon or finished. And those are the projects I think we need to also make sure our partners are aware of so they understand the project, they understand if a developer comes to the table and is trying to leverage city dollars, um, that there might need to be gap financing. Yes. And that's more what we need to do right. in terms of putting together our presentation. Are we, um, um, oh, please. In addition to that, um, we are also proposing that uh, council consider whether or not uh, we should set aside uh, $250,000 in general fund funds as well um, for developers to use. And um, I would ask, as you're thinking about that, that you consider us remaining focused on those prioritized areas that you've already selected. Um, so if you've got federal dollars plus your general fund dollars, then that means you're going to have hopefully a mix, a mix of housing um, that, um, well, let me rephrase that. You're going to have housing that people of varying incomes can buy. Let me put it that way. You skipped over the free form one. Can you talk about that? Disaster recovery. That's disaster recovery money that um, we have programmed and uh, that will go toward uh, multifamily rental projects. So that's... Do we have that? That's, that's part of the $26 million that we received okay. from the federal government. That, that, um, that part is earmarked, untouchable for anything else, right? Correct. Hmm. Which project? The 31. 3.1. Ms. 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 Gentry's Gentry's turn. Turn. Thank it's you all. Isn't it glorious? Mm -hmm. So we were asked it's to be creative, yeah. so we it's have gotten creative. Yeah. Um, one of the ideas that has been tossed around for a while is, if you remember several years ago, we had a few projects that received this special source revenue tax credit. They were student housing projects that, um, if not for that tax credit, would likely have not moved forward. One of the thoughts is capturing the taxes the city's receiving from those projects and setting those aside for an affordable housing initiative. Um, would love to have the county's portion as well. That's obviously a larger conversation than we can have just in this room. There's three projects that we're already receiving that tax increase from. The other two projects are under construction, so we've identified the numbers in red of future income that could be added to that pot, and that is an annual amount once those projects come online. That's a conversation we can have now or can certainly program it in the upcoming budget discussions, which probably is the more appropriate time, but certainly want to get this on your radar to recognize the impact um, this can have in addition to what Gloria suggested on the previous slide. Just a question for that. If, if council decides to do that, um, this would be general fund money. So say take out the Empire and Solar Station. If we debt was that 190 annually, would that be added to that on the previous slide? Go back. It would. That, it, that it would be combined. At the, um, that 250 or that 250? 
the bottom. The bottom. It, okay. Yeah, it would. For, for market rate housing. That's right. We're not, we're not talking about loan money, though, are we? The, the next phase is not, not loan. It is not loan. We would obviously create the criteria. If we make the decision to set this money aside, we would create whatever criteria suited it. I do want to point out solicitation is not a student housing, but it is a project um, on the former CCI property that the city was involved with that property, as many of y'all probably remember. Yeah, what is it? To that question that Tamika asked a minute ago. You're talking about the housing project being in addition to the 250 or to be a funding source for the 250? It would be in addition to. And I think the real question was, would it come with the same <coughs> strings that some of our CDBG dollars comes with? And that would be up to us. I mean, it would be, if it does not get set aside for affordable housing, it goes into the general fund, so it would not have the same restrictions that HUD dollars have. But I think they're asking about, go back a slide. So the general fund revolving loan program, the third bullet, if that came from the general fund, right? Then it also then it would that would be an additional two hundred and fifty thousand to complement the three hundred or and or one that's right. ninety. So you're talking you're talking about taking five hundred thousand dollars plus out of the, the general this fund. the third bullet is already in the revolving loan program. It's not general fund that right. pays for general fund operations. It already exists in revolving loan, so we would divert that money those, from the loan those program. Are payments from previous CDBG projects that are being paid off. That's right. Oh, that's right. And well, current mortgages. If you recall, too, Mr. Duvall, I think we had the discussion with you all about um, timeliness and HUD's interpretation now of with our revolving loan fund. How much of that money can be sitting there for each, you know each year that doesn't go against our timeliness requirement. Right. And so I think the effort, too, that Gloria and Missy have talked about is to, you know, keep that money moving. Mm -hmm. um, and this would be an effort to use it in a little bit different way than what we have, although we love our home loan program the way it is. But I do think that just based off what we're seeing and hearing from HUD, that this would be a good way to move those funds. I will point out, while that seems like a lot of money, if you combine that 250 with the next slide, think about the gap on the projects we've already identified. Um, yeah. that, that is not enough to cover the gap on any one of those projects. I think uh, 360, I, 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 say I, I, don't, I think we, we should do as much as we possibly can. I, and I appreciate the um, creative approach to it. I'd love to see that 360. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's an annual commitment that we can level over a period of time to maybe make bigger deals happen as they might present themselves. Um, but that 360 um, direct contribution, how we do it, is great. I think uh, it is leverage is that much more attractive. And remember, in the coming year, we're talking 190 out of off of this slide because sure. the two projects in red are under construction. We, do you guys still need a sense of the body from? Um, Memo submitted to council months ago on, on the, basically the approach. Yeah, it, that that now that was that probably got a little more into the weeds with just the concept of you know, using the same tool that we use for student housing, maybe putting it on the table for affordable housing as, as well. See what type of private sector activity we can we can generate. You know, other than foregone half of the foregone tax revenue for 10 years, we didn't put any skin in the game um, on those deals. And I wonder yeah, if, a, if a, we can make a 4% deal feel more like a 9% like a deal by um, uh, baiting some of the taxes for a period of time. Just, again, more ways in which we can not look at necessarily capital contribution or any way, but just, <coughs> again, just kind of tickling things and, 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 and letting let see what the private sector might might do to help fill that, that, that need. And similar to what we did with student housing, um, we would establish some criteria that projects would have to meet in order to be considered eligible. So some of the criteria may be the number of units based on the total investment. It would have a requirement that they remain affordable for a certain period of time. Income requirements um, vary in density. We also are looking into what we're going to refer to today as the San Antonio model. So we'll bring more information about that as well. 
And most of those comments, as you reflect in that memo, might be worth recirculating it. It was based on conversations with different developers. They may have been more time timely 24 months ago than, than now. I would encourage more conversations with more developers to see what might look like something attractive, again, to get what we want, uh, the type of development we want, not just what folks want to bring. In. But yeah, I wish you. I think that concept would work well with what we discussed with the Chamber and local government committee that mm -hmm. designated certain target areas and mm -hmm. all of us bringing up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, oh, no, I think you find uh, significant interest. I mean, you know, we use multi county industrial parks, but the county had the big stick there. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. Richland went in, probably Richland too, but I know Richland would be interested in having some high quality workforce housing, particularly you know, surround, in, and, in and around existing um, uh, schools. They'd love it. I'm sorry. Just, Go ahead. just a question. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of looking at different models, I, I think we ought to be doing that because there's always somebody that's doing something you know, can spark some of what we're thinking about. But um, how, what are our chances of getting um, credits for what we put on the table locally to increase some of our requests from the feds? They don't consider local match the way they used to? It seems, and I'm, Gloria may want to chime in as I finish. Um, in our current partnership with HUD, a lot of things have changed mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, seems to be more restrictive and more less lenient. And if you could ever consider HUD lenient, which you probably couldn't, but things seem to be a little more challenging. So I don't know that they're going to look at local funding as more leverage to get more money we can certainly ask but it seems to be that there's less money coming from the feds um, which is part of why with the importance of our partners and I want to talk about one other challenge okay, we have just, just, just we, we need shovel ready projects and one of our challenges is to get project shovel ready it takes money and a lot of times our corporations are left with trying to go after the CDB G yeah. G money to get it shovel ready which then gets us into the cycle of being challenged with timeliness. We really need our partners to come forward if there's some funding they could make available to get it shovel ready, which then puts us in a better position when we do open up NOFA and try to use our CDBG dollars. Are those part of the housing corporation? All of our own development corporations. It is really important when they apply for projects that they be shovel yeah. ready because it's so challenging. The time frame for meeting timeliness is so tight that if they have to apply for money to get it shovel ready, they really just can't meet timeliness. And, and I, they're all here. They will tell you that's an ongoing struggle that we're Or if they're going to get it to that point, then we need a private partner to take right. it on, right. to, to take it and, yeah. and run with it at that point. If we're going to put the money into the site development and the acquisition and we, we got, Well, we got a couple million dollars worth of shovel ready projects now. Exactly, so, okay. exactly. I mean, so let's, let, and, and, and then we, general fund doesn't come with all the strings attached as well, right? So, I mean, so let's hit those. And, and, and this I idea was just more so around just kind of creating the environment mm -hmm. and, see, and seeing what, what, what happens and, and, and getting out of the way. Mr. Mayor. But, yeah, yes, yes, sir. The reason I asked the question about the local match, um, I, I think, well, it, it seems to me that, you know, the, one of the reasons the, the federal dollars appear to be either drying up or flowing a lot slower than it did is because I think of a perception that on the local level folks were just asking and asking but not necessarily doing and with some of the numbers that we're throwing around up here now that we know we have to me that shows that we're putting forth an effort to you know at least set the foundation for, for uh, the feds being considerate for what we're doing with local money, as tight as local dollars are, you know? So I guess, Mr. Mayor, I'm asking, do you have any kind of sense of how that approach would play nationally with Washington? Yes, I do. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I mean, I would just say, and then I think this discussion and others that we've had is is timely. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we've got to get to the point if you know what we get is is great but we don't need to be depending on federal dollars and we honestly don't need to be waiting for for to see what's going to happen things are changing up there on a daily basis the climate been going is changing on for 10 years though we, we we need to be focused on doing our own plan right so we need to yeah we need to just focus on what we can do and then if we get you know what we get federally that's fine but you know keep waiting thing projects aren't going to get done so I, I wouldn't say that needs to we get creative. Our we create our own yeah. destiny. Period. I, mean, I, I love. I love this. I mean, I'd be yeah. ready to vote on it today. Well, there, there was a period of time last year when not only City of Columbia, I think all entities were concerned whether the federal dollars were coming at all. Um, we ended up getting funding at the same level, but it took a lot longer this cycle than it normally does. We're optimistic that that won't be the case with the cycle coming up. That we'll stay on the normal. Time frame, but it certainly was um, giving us a pause as to what was going to go on federally. Against the backdrop of, it, of, of Washington, D.C. instability, and not just instability, but the, uh, I, I mean, we've seen support for local development, um, community development uh, go down probably every year since the Nixon administration. This is not really new, but a brand new level of, uh, of challenges and Washington right now. There'll be some additional tools on the table. I mean, we're, all, we're all talking about the Investing Opportunities Act and what that could possibly mean as well. But um, I think that just underscores the, in the importance of us being very intentional, very deliberate, very results oriented, very numbers oriented as to how many units we want to see come online in, in, in X amount of time and the things that we have to drive and we have to make sure that we're pushing internally as well as, again, the environment that we can create for the private sector to help meet those needs by incentivizing it and getting the heck out of the way. I mean, I mean, we just, I just think we have to be very, very, very intentional and very time sensitive. You know, the last week will show you that, I mean, we, no one knows what the market's going to look like in hmm. six months or 12 months or 24 months. Next it's tomorrow. <laughs> Tonight. So, so, let, let's, um, so we just got to push. Hard, fast, now. Hard, fast, now. All right, that's, that's good. That's good. Get Beltline Boulevard done, too, by the way. We got moving. I don't know who owns it now. But it might be Melissa now. Or, or I don't know who has it now. But, uh, all right. So, so was so was that the end of the presentation? That, that is. So that wraps it up. We will need some approval or at least um, – recognition of y'all's appetite to take the funding from student housing um, during the budget process and factor that in to upcoming budget discussions. And what about the details on proposing our own incentive similar to what we did for student housing we'll, or affordable housing? Um, I would suggest we all, my group plus Ryan and Jeff work together to come up with some criteria for y'all to look at and approve. We'll make a recommendation. Okay. Um, and Mr. Mayor, the only thing I'll add is y'all know I'm like a broke record. I say this all the time, but you know, if we're going to do this, the other thing is we've got fabulous private developers who want to get things done. Um, but the problem in the past has been, you know, making sure that there is the the requisite amount of support for them to do a project. And so this council, we need to be intricately involved in messaging it so that people understand that affordable slash workforce housing um, is not just needed in this community, but the, quote, people that people don't want in their communities are all of us. And we've got to make sure that the private developers come to the table and feel like Columbia wants them or else they're going to go take their projects other places. A wonderful example is, is the veranda, the developer for that project didn't get to move forward with a project several years ago here, but he came back to the table, so I mean, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you all. Thank you all. He's asking.
Thanks all Gloria. our partners, too. Gloria. Oh, Gloria, Gloria. when you get a chance. <laughs> hey, Fred. No, that's not that's a different guy. It's the same one. I want to be there. Different okay. Congratulations. I want to see some rent. No. Different oh, Of course. Well, Howard will give him some money. Don't worry. Yeah. He's the builder. He's the builder. Oh, okay. The guy that buys it. Thank you. Uh, it's syndicated. Yeah. Yeah, we need both. Well, yeah, they want. Are they? Yeah. Yeah, how much they collect? They collected last year. Yeah. Two million. Oh, I like to know who is who. Okay. Oh, I know who Dwayne is. Hey, Doc, how you met? I don't know. I haven't seen their application. Thank you. I hadn't seen their application. Oh, he was asking. Me. Good, thank you, sir. Okay. No, I know Reggie. No, he was sitting Oh, Jay Whitfield with. You can't oh, remember those numbers. Oh, okay, okay. Well, that was a I good. I found them right here. That's a very good. Excellent. Hey, did, did we not invite the new? Feel like they were just here. Midland Housing Trust Fund guy. I've not met him yet. Yeah, I didn't. I thought that. Okay. I'll, I'll make sure I get that. I guess. I mean, he's still at the wherever Midland House yeah, Trust Fund. I mean, whatever that number is, Jamie's still on their board. But um, yeah, he needs to be part of these conversations. Both these presentations. Uh, so. Did everybody get a copy? That's my fault. Of Eric's presentation. Here. Um. Yes, they all have it. God, we had this thing down to seventy million. I see. I can't leave y'all children alone. See, I would have if I could afford to be out yesterday, but literally I had. I won't even go into detail. It was a bad day. So I haven't eaten. I actually had chicken soup for lunch today. Or something I've eaten since Sunday, and now you feel funny after today. No, it's not okay, but I just feel like I need to just continue to settle my stomach. Yeah. Settle okay. That last two days. So, good afternoon, right. Council Mayor. We um, are here to start um, some. Keep it down in the hall. <laughs> Thank you. As Daniel says that, <laughs> we're about to start some pretty serious discussions about um, health care and planning for the budget. And so um, we have some information that um, Eric Atwaters is here with Aon to walk us through his presentation. Um, the hope is at the end that we have a little more direction on kind of some things that at least some things you don't want to do um, to move us forward on how we um, deal with our OPEB and, and the long-term liability. So hopefully at the end of this discussion, we'll have um, at least some direction Hold on where we want to move forward, um, have some questions answered that are very important to guide this whole discussion and to lead us in the direction that we want to go in. So Eric has some questions that he needs some answers to um, that will help direct us to our next meetings and our next presentations and kind of the direction that we take as a city. So I'm going to turn it over to him. And um, okay. uh, Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, good afternoon. Hey. I, I, I see the crowd stuck around for my exciting presentation. <laughs> uh, as uh, Ms. Benjamin said, uh, we're going to talk about your retiree medical plan, the OPEB, uh, kind of do a little bit of house cleaning first, give you some background information. Uh, and then kind of look at what I'll call the current state, where you stand today, and then provide some options for you. Uh, there's a ton of options that you have. We'll go through those and then walk through some pros and cons and then kind of get to those key questions we talked about. And, and, and just to back up for, for a second, once we've got answers or, or good direction on those key questions, I can help guide you in terms of a lot of these options, what makes the most sense. I mean, you're going to see it. There's a ton of options in here. 
Um, but again, once we answer those key questions, that'll provide us uh, some goals and objectives. Uh, so, so with that being said, uh, while we're here, I met with you it was this September of last year. It's, it's been that long that we initially had that initial meeting. And there, there were three or four things that you asked us to come back and do. Um, one thing was to research what the impact of, of funding OPEC Trust would be, uh, to quantify the impact if you stuck more money into the trust, and then to look at um, variations on contributing the full amount of $48.7 million or, or derivations of that. So, so this document provides all, all of that analysis. Throughout the document, you'll see we kind of quantify the savings in kind of three areas for you. We say immediate savings, so what's going to be the impact of next fiscal year? And then we kind of say what I call intermediate, which would be over the next five years, and then long term. Uh, as, as you'll see a lot of these projections, some of these items will occur immediately, but we're talking about a very long term projection as people retire and start receiving these benefits. Okay. On, um, on page four here, just a disclosure, uh, the main thing is I, I am not a lawyer. Uh, we don't practice law. Um, so you know, any options here, you, you know, obviously you will need to talk to your legal counsel about the ramifications. Um, just a little background about your funding and budgeting process. Uh, you know, currently you've got the $48.7 million sitting in the bank account. And, and you've accumulated that money by essentially what I'll call partially pre-funding some of your benefits. Uh, you've paid roughly 75% of the annual required contribution. Uh, here we talk about the, the annual OPEP cost. I'm not going to get into the technicalities, but you, you've essentially paid most of that. And if you pay what we call the full ARC over the lifetime of the plan, you know, you fund the plan. So you haven't been funding it all the way, but you have been setting aside monies you know, above the pay-as-you-go cost. And, and that's how you've gotten to that $48.7 million you have in the trust. Okay. Any questions? Uh, so a little bit of background. Um, in, in addition to, you know, you, you want to make this decision, there's also the impact of, of Government Accounting Standards Board Statement Number 75, or GASB 75. So, so what does that do? That statement is going to move this liability for the OPEP plan. Right now, it's a notice disclosure in your financial statements. It's going to move to the balance sheet. So you're looking at moving roughly from a note disclosure to about $200 million of liability to the balance sheet with no assets. Just want to make sure that's clear. Now, Say that again. We're moving this liability to the actual balance sheet. Currently, the way the liability is disclosed, it's a notes to your financial statements. It is going to be on the balance sheet, so literally $200 million of liability is going to go on the balance sheet in FY18. Every, for everyone everywhere. Every, for, for here, it's going to be 200 million. Other people, it's probably a billion. It's a big number. But everyone is going to have to put this number on their balance sheet. Which is negative. Unless you have some other type of assets to go on. I mean, you know, that's. Um, any other questions around that? So it, the rest of these, there's some terms that are changing with this standard changes. The term ARC, you know, annual required contribution, is replaced by actual determined contribution. So you'll kind of hear me use those simultaneously. Don't worry about it. They mean the same thing. Uh, but, but this statement, the main thing about this statement is really going to put this on a balance sheet. So, you know, that's going to be a significant change from where we are today. Is, is the uh, pension liability already on the balance sheet or is it on notice? Yes. Yes. It is. So it's in the enterprise fund. It goes directly in there. It doesn't look as bad because when it combines all the assets of the water sewer system, it don't notice it as much. But in the general fund, all governmental is in our long term debt. So it doesn't reflect in the annual operations, but it is out there on our statements within our fund as a unit. And so this will increase it. Uh, any other questions before we get on to the current state? No. Okay. No. So, what, so, yeah, so that two hundred million showing up, what, what's that going to mean? What's that going to look like? What, what is well, it'll be split between the parking, water and sewer, storm. Anyone that has employees, it'll be spread out. It'll be just like we did the pension. So again, it will reflect. It'll be an item out there. Uh, in water and sewer will probably be one of the larger ones. doesn't necessarily affect the fund balance uh, because we will record it with our long-term debt, which is where we have all the 
all by itself. But it will still be out there. And it will highlight when Bud comes mm -hmm. uh, next month to talk about audit and all. That will be one of the items we'll talk about. This will be crushing to some places. It is. I mean, literally, when we were going through a pension, um, you know, we talked to the Government Accounting Standards Board and said, you know, can these entities afford to put this on the books? Because essentially, this liability is supposed to be recognized anyway as the rate agencies look at you. Um, and, you know, obviously, we were unsuccessful. And, you know, once pension went into effect, we knew retired medical was going to be right behind it. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. And, and, and just to pat yourselves on the back a little bit, the $200 million liability you have is – is a lot lower than a lot of places you're going to see. Yeah. Still it's, not good enough. It, it may be not good enough, but, but it's a lot lower sure. because of the, the, the DBV. So, so with that being said, let's just get into where you are now. So your, your current structure for your retired medical is you give everyone a, a flat dollar, flat payment for their retired medical benefit. Call that the DDB. And that's supposed to be flat forever, correct? Now, last fiscal year, um, you did not maintain that amount. You had to increase it so the retirees' premium wouldn't go up so much. So you actually did not hold a DDB line last year. Okay? What I'm going to show you here is what if you continued that practice? What if every year you said, hey, you know, retirees, we, we, we can't have you have this premium increase, so we're just going to have to, we're going to take on the cost. If you continue to do that, your liability is going to double at least at a minimum. I'm showing you here the 4% increase. That is at the low end of ultimate medical inflation. So, so, so it's likely that that number will be increasing higher. I wanted to show you four just to be conservative. As you can see, your liability goes from roughly $190 million to $390 million. So, so we talked about $200 million being on the books. If, if the practice you continue last year continues, the number's going to be almost $400 million. And as actuaries, we are required to value the substantive plan. Your plan says we're going to pay this fat dollar a month. What the substantive plan does is what are you actually doing? And what you're actually doing is you're not maintaining that. You didn't last year. You're not maintaining that flat dollar amount. So, so, so that's kind of our, our first big decision point. How committed are you to maintaining that? Because that's going to dictate what these other options are going to, what they're going to look like and how far you're going to have to go. Um, so I just want to show you graphically the cash flow. So again, I've shown you this before. The dark green are your current retirees, you know, and again, they they, have, they essentially uh, get off their payroll. And then lighter green are your current active employees, and then that other green is kind of future high. If you look over the next 20, 25 years, future highs will have no impact on cash, right? Because they've got to get to retirement and start drawing a benefit. So it's mostly your current retirees and your current active employees. Well, that's true. But not true, because at the end of the day, they will have an impact because of everything that goes to get to that point. So, there, there will be other areas where you'll be paying for them, but in terms of retiring, everybody medical, impacts this if we don't make a change. Yeah. And so, we're showing you here the, the pure cash outlay. I want to show you what if you continue your current practice and not maintain that DDB. As you can look at it, I mean, these numbers are going to get about three times as high. So instead of having this level pattern, now you've got this steeply increasing pattern, which is what we see for the most part with a lot of other public entities. So I want to go on to, to page 11 and show you what the liability looks like. So, so I just showed you the cash flows. This is liability. So with liability, as future hires come in, they have more impact on the liability, right? Because we know they got to receive the cash into the future. But as they come in, we start valuing the liability for them. So as you see, if you maintain the DDB, you're looking at a very kind of almost level liability, right? I mean, you know, the current retirees are going to leave, and then they'll be replaced by the future hires. But on page 12, again, if you do not maintain that DDB, you're going to be looking at a billion-dollar liability in about 30 years. So let me say that one more time. If you do not maintain the DDB, your liability is going to be about five times as high in about 30 years. You Eric, can see it. You never did say in the front or in this thing what DDB stands for. It stands for yeah, I'm still dollar trying. benefit. It's undetermined benefit. Yeah, but a dollar amount would be set. Say it again. Five dollars. Thank you. Thank you. 
defined dollar benefit. So what, what, what you have actually have been doing is not a defined dollar benefit. Um, it's an increasing dollar benefit. And again, if that practice continues, we're looking at a liability, again, jumping from 200 million, we'll call it, to almost 400 million immediately, and continue to increase. So now that we've seen all this, so what are your options? Cool. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sorry, before we go on, because I was just asking the city manager, because yeah. I didn't re recall us actually affirmatively deciding not to go with the DDB last year. And so she just pointed out to me that basically our deciding not to make a decision last year led to us doing that. So I just kind of wanted to point that out, that we've got to have this, this discussion and have to make some decisions because I wasn't aware that the world, us the world, not the world, the world is still moving. Yeah. It, the world still moving. Yeah, whether we act or not. Yeah, right. But it's the it's the I think the rub was the premium amount. Um, at least that's what you As all related, communicated so was it, was it, was to it, me. Was it, it was, was retirees. What was it? Retirees. It was, yeah. Retirees. Yeah. Right. It, was, it was precipitously high. What was it? What was the number? Which was up how much percent? Which is up? I mean, it skyrocketed. Yeah, it was right? like. But it was it was based off maintaining that DDB. So that's. That was you know, the rub. I mean, that, that was, was the rub. The rub. Right. I mean, either you were going to maintain it, and that's the that's <coughs> what you had to do to maintain it, just okay. by the numbers. Okay. Or we find another approach. Yeah, they're they're what four percent of our population, but thirty something percent of our cost. About or eleven percent of our population. It's eleven percent, but it's like thirty something percent of our cost. Well, we have them carved out. Their claims experience is carved out, so their premiums are based on just their claims experience, which is also I mean, which adds to that piece. So their claims experience alone is what impacted their premium. And I think as the presentation continues, Eric will show you some options mm -hmm. that, um, you know, maybe it'll make one option over another. I mean, not, nothing will do will make everybody happy, obviously. Sure. But some, we heard you that just going with the increased premiums wasn't palatable at the time anyway. Well, in so, one full swoop, in, in right. fairness, I think where we've got a target is a three a three year plan to get us to where we want to be because you just you just can't do a sweep but I think there's some there's some options on the table on both sides of the fence that might be palatable. I'm glad we are having this part of the discussion because we too thought maybe it wasn't connecting for y'all what led yeah, to let's, this. Yeah, let's let's. let's and I'm sorry, just one more question. Uh, so, Missy, are there claims? Do they mirror pretty much the rest of our print of claims? Or what, so what are, what are they? Comparatively, like Sam said, their claims are, their claims were not about nine million, but retirees plus their Maybe 
Let's get into options, y'all. Okay. All right, so, so let's, let's jump into uh, options. So I've broken down the options for you, and I've looked at the classes of employees. Probably the easiest class to look at and make changes to are people who aren't here yet, the future employees. <laughs> The problem with the easy button is that it doesn't save you a bunch of money, right, immediately. But what it allows you do, to do is to go ahead and make some decisions and say, what does our future plan look like? Um, and, and I'll just give you some statistics from um, the, the Center for State and Local Government conducts an annual survey of roughly 300 entities. Um, they do it every June, and, and I'll give you some statistics from the last June. Um, but healthcare, roughly 40% of those are, are shifting more cost to employees. I mean, obviously, you're already there with the DDB. Every year, that more costs are going to be shifted to employees. Uh, about 5% are starting to pre-fund or have considered it. And I, I think I told you this before. And uh, you, you've got roughly 3% who have increased in eligibility. But also on the flip side, if you look at the pension benefits, we're looking at probably about 20% of local plans who are increasing eligibility and our age requirement for future hires. There's some legal requirements for current employees, a lot of times with pension, but for future highs, a lot of them are making them wait longer and making them pay more for those benefits. So now I'm going to bring it back to, to the future higher slide here. So, so the 20% represents new hires? The, I'm sorry. The 20%? The, the, the 20% is for the new hires, yes, sir. All right. For, for, for uh, current employees, it's 3%. And, and, and that's mainly because... In some states like Georgia, where I live, you can't do anything to current employees unless you, you want to have a lawsuit. So it, it depends on some of the state law, but for future hires, you know, they're not subject to that law. All right. Did that answer your question, sir? Yeah. Okay. Um, so so I'll I show you a laundry list of options here. The, the, the first and the top being, you know, the, the most, uh, what I call the most draconian, which is what if we just eliminate coverage altogether? You know, we'll provide you access, but we're not going to pay a dime toward it. You know, again, I said, you see the immediate impact for none of these is zero because none of these people are here. But if you look over the long period, I look at 30 years, you can see you're, you're talking about roughly $30 million in savings. Now, remember I told you your liability is somewhere around, you know, 100, let's call it $200 million. So, you know, this is $30 million here over the long haul that you could save if you just totally eliminated the coverage. Well, you said, well, okay, Eric, well, we may not want to eliminate it altogether. A lot of plans are just eliminating the post-65 portion. So what if you did that? And that's the next item below. And you can see that's, that's roughly half of the pre-65. And, and I'm focused on the, the far right column, just because the first two, there's not a ton of savings there. Uh, it eliminates spousal coverage. I mean, I, I know that even in my plan as an active employee, I have a spousal surcharge. And, and a lot of retired plans are starting to eliminate that for spousal coverage or, or have a surcharge. And again, if you look at that, that's roughly, let's call it $10 million, you'll save it a long haul. And then the two items, the next two items are the things I talked about, which is making it harder to get the benefit, increasing the years or age requirements. Those dollars aren't as, as big if you look at them by themselves, but, but they still do make a dent you know, in the long-term projection. And then we go all the way down toward the bottom, items that have a little less impact. Well, what if you just lowered the DDB for those future hires? You know, just say, look, you're going to pay more. We know you're going to pay more. We're going to give you a different DDB. Uh, you can see that you know that's about ten percent of the savings from totally eliminating the plan. So, so, so these are all changes for future hires. People aren't here today. Um, you know, again, I've told you some of the trends that we're seeing with those. How does that factor into our our long term actuarial it, liability? So, uh, is that is that is that that number on the on the right? On the far right, yes, sir. That's the number on the far right. Long term, but yeah. immediate. There's no. Yeah, we really know. Yeah, it's just because it's going to take a while before we, we get those employees in. But it caps, it sets an expectation so it caps off right from the get go. So you don't have employees that are starting to expect it. Right. So you get the long So you get the long term benefit on future hires only if you eliminate pre and post 65 coverage on future hires only. That's all future hires. Okay. Yeah. Um, post 65. You get you get fifteen, close to fourteen, fifteen million. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and that's just future hires. Correct. Yeah. This is only future hires, and you know, and this when I showed you that liability, you see those future hire liabilities start coming in over the period. So this looks at that period and says, you know, what does that impact? Okay. No, I don't. Have, I'm trying to get. Okay. Will you Sorry, open the Any other questions or comment about the future hires? Anything on the slide? Just keep on trucking. Okay. 
So now let's get a little bit harder. The worst session. And I just wanted to make sure. What about employees who've been hired over the last, I chose 2009 because that's when you make some changes. So, so what about employees who've been hired over the last eight years? As you can see, the immediate impact, there's some impact on, on some of these employees because um, the way we captured some of the numbers. But again, I'm, I'm going to focus on the long-term impact. And we can talk about the short term in a minute. But you can see these numbers are a lot bigger because this is the group that's, that's here today, or, or most of them. I mean, you, you've got several employees who were hired before 2009, but this is a decent amount of liability. Now, these numbers would directly lower the number I told you about, the $200 million. So, so, so for instance, I told you the number is $200 million, um, assuming you maintain the DDB. If you said, okay, anyone hired to 2009, we're not going to offer you coverage, that $200 million goes to roughly $150 million. Because those people are actually here in seats in the day, and we will value that liability for them. Now, there, there are other issues with that, but I just want to show you these have more of an immediate impact because these are actually bodies who are in, actually in the seats. Just in 2009, that was, you just picked 2009. I think you made some significant plan changes in 2009. Yeah, I didn't know if that was. So, so that's what I, I just picked. I wanted a, a group of okay. newer hires who, mm -hmm. you know, who had been here about five years or so. Okay. And, and the other part is, you know, if this were a pension, sometimes we'll look at if they're vested or not. So I just looked at around that five-year mark to see if you make changes to them. You know, and again, the items down below, j just like they did for the future hires, don't have a ton of impact. Um, but if you did increase, you know, the eligibility and age requirement, you, you know, you still could save off roughly $15 million. So, so you could still offer a benefit to those current active employees, but say, look, you got to wait two more years to get there. You got to have a certain age. You can shave off, you know, roughly fifteen million dollars. You, you, you made reference to an earlier slide. If we're looking at two hundred million dollars long-term liability, what, what's our our um, I guess our annual retired contribution? What are we, what are we talking about setting aside? Yeah, ten around million, ten million. Sorry, yeah. That ten million is going to stay steady. I think you said. It, 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 yeah, it, it, say, say relatively. It, let's say ten currently, but that number. And it's all assuming we maintain the DDB, which we did not back in okay. September. Right. Okay, if we make it. Okay, we'll keep going. Sorry. We good? No. Thank you. Okay. No, 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 so, so now I, I go and say, what if you did this for all active employees who are here? Again, we've got a group of employees who are closer to retirement, so you know there would be some other issues with this, but I just want to show you the magnitude of this. So again, if you want to totally eliminate it, you could cut your lobby almost in half. But if you looked at eliminating the post-65, you know, that's roughly $30 million. Or you could make those same employees wait a little longer, um, and then we're looking at somewhere around a $20 million, $25 million range. You cut that liability in half, does it also cut our ARC in half? Yeah, give or take, yes. Not exactly in half, but just about. Okay. Yep. Could, that not, could that not be kind of the first column of our assessment? Yeah, so, so, so this would be the, the impact of – if you did this next year, this would kind of be – Right, the, the impact on, on your over 30 years is worth $3 million a year. Yeah. You only get your big impact in year one, in the first year, and then after that it drops to about $3 million a year. Okay. And these are savings on the liability, not the arc. C correct. The, right. the, the immediate row is kind of the savings on the arc. Those other two are kind of on the liability because it's a little long term. So it's, it's a little mix and match. Any questions on, on 16? Uh, so now we get to uh, the current retirees. So it, for the current retirees, you only look at three options here. I mean, it's either, you know, you eliminate your post-65 because you've already got employees who are pre-65 receiving benefits. You eliminate the spousal coverage or you lower their DDB amount. Uh, and again, I'm going to focus on the, the far right-hand side. You can see if you eliminate the post-65 coverage for them, you know, that's roughly $28 million. But if you eliminate the spousal coverage, you can save about half of that, and we'll call that roughly 12 or $13 million. And, of course, lowering the DDB. Now, now, this goes directly against the conversation we just had, where you can actually increase the DDB last year, and now I'm saying if you lower it at 10%, what would be the impact? I wanted to show you this number, but you just know that you're going from, you've been increasing the DDB now if we say cut it, they just know that you know you'll likely probably have retirees um, 
make sure that they, they let you know they have issues with that. Eric, do you have any statistics on how many plans offer spousal coverage? I, I do. I don't have it in my back pocket, but but I can get that to you. I can get it to you for our clients at Aon and, 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 and globally. Oh, yep. it, it would be a minimum amount, do you think? I, I will say that for active employees now, We've moved away from offering spouses. For retirees, that's that's the one I'm afraid. It's going to be a mixed bag. If you ask me for active employees, I would feel like three and four maybe, and that may, may be high. But for retirees, it, it, it's probably, I, I would say maybe one in three. And I'm just guessing right now, and I'll get you the real number. I was working with these OFED plans when it came out of the gas was 45. And mm -hmm. what we found was that it was the post-65 that was the big kicker. Right. If you could either set a defined dollar benefit and stick to it post 65, or if you eliminated post 65, right. that's where you saved your money. That's right. where the city of Charleston, the city of Greenville, the city of Rock Hill, all the big cities in South Carolina have done. They eliminated post 65, right. they eliminated family and spousal coverage, and they have reasonable contributions. We have made Yeah, um, I, I admit I'm I'm uh, I'm not an expert on benefits. So when you when we say you eliminate, that means we don't pay, we don't we don't set it up, but we what we tie them into an alternate provider. Well, it depends on whether they're if, pre sixty five or you, post sixty five. I think most of the cities when they made the change continue to have access pre-65, but post-65, they completely eliminated. I know the city of Charleston worked with, it might have been United, to set up the availability of a supplemental plan right. that is paid by the employees. It's just it's cheaper. Not, not paid by the city. It's cheaper for the employee to get the supplemental plan on their own than through us. Yes. And, and the city of Charleston only facilitated that. It, they don't pay for it. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. But our, a lot of our retiree, our post 65 retirees, are tending to separate and not take as many supplements in fear that they won't get a better plan or they can't get a better plan. So they're on our full health plan? No, they're, yeah. on, our, they're on our supplemental plan. They still but it costs about $100 a month or more per person. The yeah. premiums that they pay for that UHC plan is most likely a lot higher than what they could get on their own. And they are, you're saying most of them don't know that. And, and also, they're 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 hesitant to do it. They know it, but they don't trust it. I, I don't, you know, I'm where I was when I was with the state. So yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know the pain. I don't know if, it's, if I would, would have been better off on my own or staying with the state. The state, the state don't provide that option. All right, buyouts. Let's keep on trucking, y'all. Let's keep buyouts. on going. Okay. Buyouts. Let's go. So, so let's talk about buyouts. Uh, buyouts just, what I'm talking about. So, so just one thing about the buyout. Um, I'm going to use the term actual present value, APV. That's the liability we send, we hold for each participant to come up with that $200 million. The only way to save on the buyout is to offer them less than that value. You know, if we say it's $1,000 a person, you offer them seven, $800, the value, you save the money. The value of the liability. Right. Value the liability. We, now, now, that's based if, on if average we, life if expectancy. Based, if, we, if we consider it to be, but yeah, I'm just get. No, no, go ahead, sir. No, no, you go. Right, but, and that's based on average life expectancy and all these things. So some people are going to live longer, some are going to live shorter. We get all that. But we're saying on average, the only way to save money is offer them less than a liability. So. And what, using the term saving money, the reality is, is, is you're prepaying. And allowing them to take that funding and do what they want to do with it and go out in the marketplace, which right now is better for them than it is 
in an overall. Well, the, the reason why I say you, you do save is because in that two hundred million of liability, we would assume they get that that DDB forever until they die. So in this case, we're gonna give them a fixed dollar amount. So that's a direct savings, you know. Well, they can invest it how they want. Correct. They they can do whatever they want to. They can go buy a boat with it. And, but and, the, and this council or future council could end the DDB. Correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and I'll just say that the color of this. It, it, you know, if you look at a buyout option, I, I think you probably want to look at the end of offering retiree medical benefits. And the reason why I say that is that you're going to have all kinds of classes of employees, and so you buy one group and another group comes later. It, it just isn't a signal to employees, in my mind, that we're kind of out of retiree business. You know, we're going to offer you this benefit, future hires, you know, we'll, we'll continue to honor that. But it kind of signals that for future hires, we're, we're kind of no longer offering these benefits. Well, and it's probably, I mean, that's become the norm, unfortunately, across the thing, is that you're not guaranteed long-term benefits anymore. Right. Plus, um, people aren't, people are moving around more anyway. Longevity with an employer is not. Really it's not what it used to be. Right. 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 Um, Say that one more time now. You're saying that if we decide to do the buyout, mm -hmm. we need to end retiree coverage? I, I was saying that, in my mind, if you decide to do the buyout, for future hires, it, it signals to me that you're kind of out of the, the, the retiree medical business. Well, for anyone going intent. forward, you know, we're not offering this benefit anymore. That's gonna, the intent. We're going to pay out these people that we owe, pay them out a promise, and the future hires will get their promise. But anyone else, we're kind of out of that business. And, and I'll tell you why that signals that to me. Look, let's say we get 15 years down the road. It's right? That it, when I think it's important to say we don't Oh, we, we may feel this obligation. It, right. Okay. There, there's yeah. There's an obligation it, 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 that we feel that we that we ought to help meet. Exactly. And 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 my fear is that you get 15 years down the road. We bought out this group today, and then they either show up and say, "Hey, you know, you, you really shortchanged me, and I didn't fully understand everything." Absolutely. And uh, you know, Pam's over there getting her retirement benefit, and she's saying, "Well, wait a minute, Eric. I, you know, so, so I'm just saying you got all these different groups you got to consider. But that's why I said if you're going to do it, you probably want to just say." For future hires, we're out of that business. Now you honor the promises you've made, but I don't know if you want to continue to offer that going forward. Okay. And now, this buyout, and I'll tell you that I can think of three cases where this has been done. Um, Missouri did, is doing this on a pension plan. Um, we've had a client in California do it with their OPEP plan. And we've got one in Louisiana who's doing it with pension. This is a very new phenomenon in the public sector altogether. You know, and, and so we're starting to see a little more traction around this. Um, but, but this phenomenon of offering people less than actual present value, we can only offer it in the public sector. So private sector would never, they can't do this, the rules would prohibit them. But as a public plan, you're totally allowed. And again, the state of Missouri, and I'll see the information on them, they're going through it right now. Yes, so, so private sector, they... Private sector could just cut it off. Private sector, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to make it clear. They, they just cut it off. Yeah, they just cut it off. So you, it's, it's a wrap. Right. No, no longer offering these. Okay. Right. Okay. And with the pension, private sector can say, we're going to freeze it going forward. You don't get anything else. But they can't take what you've earned. Mm -hmm. But they can't, they can't just cash you out and say, we're going to give you 80% of your actual present value. Their rules are against that. But what would you on, pay for the spouse, though? On to this, uh, to this page. I, so... On this far left column, I show you what I call a discount from the actual present value. How much less than the actual present value we're going to give them? Um, so, you know, I, I showed you 10, 25, and 50%. Going across to the right, I show you how many participants are actually going to take it. So the 25% take rate is, let's assume that, you know, we offer it a 25% discount. So we offer people 75 cents on a dollar. And if we get 25% to take it, you can see we'll save anywhere, you know, let's just call it $7 million. How does this factor in, Mr. Sassman, too? How does this factor in spouses and obligation to spouses? This would be everyone you've got a liability for. So it would be that if I've got me and my spouse on the coverage, we would both get some payment. And I recognize the different views around the table, but I think there's some views that adopt that, that if there is an obligation, the obligation is to the employee, oh, the retiree, yeah. right. not to the spouse. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that's your opinion. Uh, that's why I said the different <laughs> views around the table. So, mm -hmm. okay, but in terms of the math, the buyout should apply to the retiree. The retiree. But right. the benefit of, 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 of lowering that liability should be calculated accordingly. That's just but you'd let a spouse buy out without getting the employee to buy out? 
No. no, 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 why, no. Why, why, you, you, you're not, uh, your obligation is not to the spouse, it's to the retiree. Yes, sir. Okay, I'd like to add something. Please. If we're going to do buyouts, we really need to consider it's all or none. If we offer it, you're going to have a there, no, employee there, there, that's... There, the, if we would make that decision, it would be an all or nothing yes. thing. There is no option. So that's what I'm saying. And depending on how you want to do the buyout, it's a... Did you, did you we just say the same thing? Did you just say the same thing? You, you're, talking, you're talking about employees and retirees. And you're talking about all no, retirees. That's not, no, you're all saying the same thing. No, that's yeah. not what we're saying. Okay. We're saying that you can't offer some people to buy out yeah. and some people Everyone. stay on. It's Everyone's either all or nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're talking about active employees that are eligible? Well, and, and here we were Wayne looking at your, your retirees. Retirees. These yeah. are retirees right yeah. there. That's math. Yeah. So, so let me just, just repeat what I think I heard is that. What council is saying is that the obligation is to the retirees, and you would buy them out. But for the spouse, you're not so sure you would actually buy them out. Is that did I pay for? Well, the, the spouse wasn't part of wasn't an employee. Yeah. No, he's saying though that if they were on the plan. Yeah, they're on the plan now. Of the of the retiree, the retiree might be carrying the spouse and or the spouse and dependents, right? Correct. Yeah, but so I mean, if that, you that, buy that them may... out, it applies to everybody they were carrying. Well, that's if you don't change the plan ahead of time. That's where I was going with it. Yeah. I mean, that's that. You know, one of the things that keeps coming up in every presentation we've gotten is the the, the fact that, that they're still that we on. need to, that we need to look at the spousal right. and we need to look at the retiree who, if they're working for somebody else and has the opportunity right. to get health care there, they should be getting it there, not from us, right. because of exactly what we're looking at this long term liability. So you're you're. That suggested, Mr. Rickman, as because I, I know you mentioned earlier, like a three-year approach. I'm not knowing what you'll do, but there's the possibility that you would do that first, changing the plan, and then move into another year where you would go to the buyout potentially. Yeah, I mean, you look at 30 years. Look, in 30 years, a projection showed it could be a billion dollars. All right, so just think about that. In 30 years, what it would take us to get, get there, to and we got $50 million in the bank. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, I don't have to get the calculator out. But, <laughs> but the discussion of changing the plan first well, I think is that to was, sort of soften it. Well, I think that's what we've said, is that we fundamentally have to look at the plans and figure out what those changes and where we want to move, and then we can make a, a, a decision on this. But one of the falters in, in what happened before is, is we never were able to get to the table from all the different things that were happening to talk about, well, yeah, that piece of paper said $800 or whatever that number was that was thrown around, but we never had the opportunity to sit down and go, well, we're looking at it making the changes over a period of time so it's less in, impactful because we can't continue to go. You can't continue to treat your post-65 retirees as active employees. You just, it, it's, it's, it's not fiscally responsible, number one, and it's and fiscally financial. or financially. Uh, right. So, I mean, I think for us, knowing this and knowing this and then looking at how we may possibly yeah. make changes to the plan, because the one thing we want to do is make sure that we're providing a stable, healthy plan for the active employees that are here today. Mm -hmm. How we address post-65 and pre-65 future and liabilities will have to build after we're able to look at that, but we need to be looking at it together so that as we move forward, we know how that, that could be. And, you know, you could have, a, we're going to do buyouts over a three-year period, maybe. I, I don't know. It's something to look at because what I keep hearing from a lot of the retirees is they can go get a, a supplemental plan that is much more efficient. What they're worried about is the funding. So if you give them an account, now if they blow their money, that's their decision. But if you're buying them out and they've got a health account, then they can they can figure it out. They're going to end up saving money. But it's the blowing the account that scares me. But, but you know, but you're adults. We, we're not a nanny state. We can't yeah. supply crying rooms and pillows for everybody. You have 50 firemen sitting over here that took their money and bought a boat. <laughs> you guys have such good behavior. Murray. 
then you're not going to stop. This council will cave to them every time, and they will go out and spend the money, and then they will get into financial trouble. But, 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 to bail them out. but, but I but think Howard, that well, if you make that a decision, you're a grown adult, and you decide that a boat is better than health care. I have seen it happen, but, but, but you can't hold it. If we, if, if we, if we, at some point, we're going to bring my gavel down here. If, 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 if we, if we, if, but look, if we at some point. Decide that that's what we're going to go. It also comes with education. I, I, indeed. I don't even know why y'all are debating let's keep, that. Hey, let's, let's, let's get back to the math, okay? Yeah. Educate. Yeah. We'll talk about the policy stuff. Right. Yeah. Let's get to the math. Okay. Um, where were we on the bio? Uh, <laughs> again, the rest of this table just shows you the portion of people that will take it and then the various discounts. So, so I just want to clarify one thing to the council. The question about breaking out the spouses out of this number, I have to go back and look at it. But is that of interest to you guys to see if, if we didn't include We don't know. We just, the, the, the conversation really comes down to if you did something. You know, right. What if? Our obligation is not to the spouse. It's to the employee. And that's the way we need to be focused. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so going on to page 20. So what I did want to show you is how much money the average uh, retiree would get on the various cases. Your average pre-65 is about 58. Your average post-65 employees is roughly 74 years old. Hmm. If you just think about, they're going to get paid over their lifetime. And of course, the one who's 58 has a much longer life expectancy. So if you look at the pre-65 retirees, uh, you offer a 10% discount. You pay these people out roughly, uh, roughly $128,000. <laughs> you guys see his fingers twiddling over there, his foot tapping. <laughs> what? He can figure out how many boats he can buy. Just, 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 just balance sheet. He's, 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 just, he's, just, he's, just, he's, he's over there twitching and everything. I, I apologize. <laughs> no. Yeah, please good yeah. say something. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, yeah, just keep an eye on him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, we do have a defibrillator out there somewhere. Don't we? <laughs> we do have a defibrillator. <laughs> Okay. okay. <laughs> well, please continue. Okay, so uh, did, did I go down the chart just showing you, but this came up last time. You know, if you look at the post 65, their amounts are much smaller. Sure. We're talking about paying them somewhere, you know, in the $30,000 range. Sure. And this is the average employee, right? We understand it. It was based on each individual's age. And one thing I do want to articulate on the buyout, the devil's in a lot of the details here, because as you go through this, someone mentioned education. That's going to be really in key that, one, that we prepare them and we drive them toward whether the plan you want them to go toward. Um, and, and then you're gonna probably have to do either some edu some statements or something, maybe one-on-one -on -one counseling just to help employees to at least advise them. So, you know, maybe some of your savings you spend on that stuff, but I just wanna make you aware of it, that, you know, because of the issue we talked about. Okay? Uh, so let's talk about free funding. Any other questions on buyout before we go into pre-funding? So, so now we, we're talking about pre-funding. I think I told you that, you know, roughly 5% of the plans, you know, said they were looking to start pre-funding. And I'll, I'll say that in addition to the roughly 5% or so that are pre-funding. So still not a lot of plans are pre-funding this retiree medical benefit. But under the new GASB standards, there is some tangible benefits to doing that. You have a lower liability. Uh, in fact, if you were to pre-fund, and I'm not getting numbers here, your liability will be roughly uh, $40 million lower because of the way the rules are going to work under this new standard. What does that, what does that do to the uh, it, it, What, what does arc. it do to the ARC? $40 million on 15. It's going to lower the ARC maybe two. A million? Yeah, a couple million dollars. Um, oh, I guess two point two. Yep. Two point one two. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there is, if you put the whole thing in and then start prefunding, it's the 2.8. So the 2.8 I'm showing here, you, you get two benefits here. One, one you get the... Uh, you get the benefit of, of using a, a lower liability because of the way the standards work. And then your arc is reduced because you got now $48 million sitting into the trust. So, so that 2.8 is kind of like two pieces you, you get the benefit of. And obviously, spending it has a much different effect than putting the trust in your balance sheet, Jeff. So what does that, what does that mean to your ratings agencies and others? Uh, okay. All right. All right. Super. It, it does have, it has so, so well, I'm going to skip the next page. We just show you that some of you put half the money in, and we'll go on okay. to talk about the impact on the uh, credit rating. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to go right here to, to talk about how the credit agencies kind of look at pension and OPEB obligations together. And they account, you know, what, the debt and liability profile, roughly 20%, you know, they're looking at an entity. You were 
so, so, if, so if you just think about that from a perspective of. <laughs> If you think about that 20% from a perspective of, you know, how much impact it's going to have, you know, 80%, they're looking at these other things. But, but they do look at the debt of the entity to impact the credit rating. Yeah, I'll go on to the next page. Uh, and the other thing they look at, too, is kind of they look at the current state, where you are today. And then they also look at where you're going in the future state. Um, we show here adjusted net pension obligation, but that's, that's pension or OPEB. Um, Moody's actually makes some adjustments to what you put on your financial statements to get to a point of what they say the liability is. So the, the liabilities that Moody's will have you at for OPEB will be different than anywhere you'll see because they, 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 they make up their own number. Well, I don't say they make up their own. They use their own methodology to come up with that liability. Uh, now, S&P, who's your other agency, they, they use the rates that are in the CAFR. How, how, how are how are their projections showing? They're pretty much on the. They're, they're very on, similar. On I'll, I'll, when they. Yeah, they're, they're pretty. I'll just go back to this page. If you, you look at kind of look at how they kind of look at this. Now, if I would, I know you don't are rated by Fitch. Fitch has a lot different methodology. But you're not rated by them. But if you look at it, the debt and liability is about the 20% component. The economy is about 20 But then they start differing on the financial management and then kind of the governance portion. You can see that uh, Moody's kind of has a bigger bucket. But those two pieces uh, versus S and P doesn't. Did answer your question. Sir? Yep. So, so, so just to summarize, what impact this has on the, the credit rating, and I'll, I'll let Jeff also comment. We also talked to your financial advisor, and he pointed out some things, you know, in your last statement that the rating agency did talk about. You know, some of the flexibility of having this clash. It was at least. Uh, It was uh, Moody's that, that, that talked about this. It, it, I'm going to skip. It, it's on page 39. You have it in here in the back. Sorry. Right there. Uh, and, and I'll, you know, the, the bowl bomb not at the bottom. But you see Moody's talks about, you know, the fact that the funds are highly liquid and not in the trust. You know, they saw this as a strength. And, and this is directly from, from, from your last, uh, the 2008, 2016, sorry, financial statement. So, so to summarize, that, so, how, so, how, how, so how does that weigh? What, what, how, how does it, so with the seesaw, with the seesaw land, is it level us out? It, 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 I mean, having having fifty million in cash has got to be pretty attractive. Having that liability, cash is, all, all cash is a strength of the city. When you look at the sixteen and, and a lot of our other rating agencies, when they talk, they, like they always care. talk about our profile and what you're strong in. They always list weaknesses and strengths. Strength for us has always been the amount of cash. So if we lower that, that's not going to be a credit positive. That's going to affect. Yeah, but it it's doesn't got to mean balance out it, the you're right. It doesn't mean it's going to lower it because they're going to take a look at what you've done long term. But Brent has talked with them extensively on it. And there's no guarantee of anything. Mm -hmm. Just that lowering cash isn't going to help. But having a financial policy that's sustainable long term is a positive. So it, it comes down to you know when they go to their board whatever their committee or group meeting is, those are the type of conversations that the individual analysts for the state will have with their board that makes the final decision. So when we go and talk to them, if we choose to do this, we will really, during our rating calls, talk about how we have improved something sustainable long term, and that's a long term good for us. So those are, the, mm -hmm. I, there's just no way to know though. Sure. What the impact that, is. Part of it's good, part of it isn't. In all of the scenarios, but presented us in the previous slides um, uh, suggest exhausting the, the entire 48 million? So uh, in the previous slide for the buyout, I, I kind of showed you a range. You said, you know, what if you took half of it, what if you took the whole 48 million? Okay, okay, it, gotcha. It, those big numbers. Yeah, I, thought that, I thought that was takedown. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I kind of showed the take rate. And I think in this case, we'll assume that you took that whole 48.7 million and actually use it for a buyout on page, um, page 19. I agree. You know? Yep. Yeah. So, so, so I did just want to add a little color around, you know, if you did the buyout and use some of the cash, you know, you are taking away some of that li liquidity. But if you did a buyout and, and you, you know, you offer people fifty percent of the value, you know, I would think that that would be a net positive because you know you're offering them so much less than the, the liability. Sure. Okay. So, 
So now that we've talked about options, radio agencies, so now let's get into the hard stuff of kind of making a decision and some key questions and key consider considerations. Um, before we go there, I just talk about a few of the pros and cons, and, and some of these you've already talked on. Um, you know, we talked about changing the plan or changing eligibility. You know, it, it reduces the unfunded liability and future cash flow like I showed you. Um, it doesn't have any impact on, on morale if you do it for future hires, but if you do those changes for current employees, you understand it's going to impact morale. You know, that, that's just a known fact, right? If you, even if you make them wait an extra two or three years, there are going to be some employees who are, are you know, it's going to reflect some of the morale. Um, you had a question, sir? I just, uh, okay. But three years, four years, though, um, that gives you time to plan Right. Existing employees help them one digest it and two come up with a with their plan to to you know Correct. jump yep. off. Yep. Yeah, if you kind of phase it in, let them know, hey, you got this runway coming, we're gonna make these changes, it does give them time to kind of maneuver. At least most of your employees who aren't close to retirement. Uh you know, some of the negatives easy to pay. We haven't talked about litigation at all in, in any of these items. Um again, I'm not a lawyer, but you know, if you get into the buyout, you know, you're going to have to have some serious legal advice. Um, I'll just tell you my experience. I don't think you can mandate that buyout. I'm not a lawyer again, but my experience of dealing with these type of situations where you're offering people less than the value, you have to make it optional. And there's a way to design a program. So you can, so you can end it. You can end it. <laughs> exactly, but but but, yeah, yeah, but but I'm saying you have to be careful about the choice of words we use yeah, so, because of the whole litigation so. issue. So you can say, hey, you take this or get nothing. You can do it that way, but you can't say everybody's got to take it. You know, I'm just saying that the, the, the devil's in the details. You, you've got to, you've kind of got to make it optional. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's, let's muscle through this, y'all. Okay. Yeah, so so, so I'm, I'm going to skip let's, the pros and cons so yeah, we can keep moving. Sure, let's, um, let's muscle. So, so let's get into the meat of it. Um, you know. What we need to kind of answer and what we need to define so that we can get to a point of looking at, you know, some packages. The first, the biggest thing is the DDB level. You know, I mean, how committed, you know, are you to maintaining that DDB level? Because if you continue to increase that DDB level, yes, that's less to come out of retirees' pockets. But then that means that other groups, we got to touch more to, to make this all work financially. So you don't have that billion-dollar liability out there in the future. I mean, that, that, that to me is the very first decision point. Is are we going to maintain the DDB? Are we comfortable maintaining that, or are we going to have this increase in DDB? Because again, like I said, that dictates you know how severe the changes have to be. Affordability and sustainability. You know, we've talked about the nine million dollars that you're paying now, and you know we know long term, you know you don't want to pay thirty five million of cash, but then what is the number? You know, what what do you see as affordable and sustainable? You know, is it seven million? Is it six million? Well, it's, it, 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 that's an irrelevant conversation because if you look at the long-term outcast of what it will cost us, uh, that number doesn't even come close to getting us where we need to be. Well, well I disagree to say this is irrelevant. I think it's, it's extremely relevant in terms of you've got to know how much I can afford to design a plan that meets those objectives. Well, I mean, we can afford zero to be truthfully, but okay. th that's, that's not a reality either. Well, so my point is, is you've given us the numbers of where we're headed and where we go. Now we got to figure out what we can do. Okay. I mean, that's that's the reality of it. I mean, you know, what is what is our long term outlook, and are we willing to continue on the path that we are, where we know there's no end in sight, or do we look at alternatives and what those are? We may have to be creative. You know, like mm -hmm. you said, the buyout was. Only a few people. Well, they got creative. They got out of the box and they figured out how to address their situation. Mm -hmm. Ours may be a, a, a multiple of things, but I think the information you provided us is very helpful for us to get that conversation yeah. going. And, and, and these questions are they're for you, but they're also for me. Because if you say, hey, Eric, I want to pay five or six million dollars, I can then go back and say, okay, put these package options together. You get back, you get back into something. Right? Yeah, but, but if you just say, hey, uh, you know, it's. I, mean, I have to have some direction in terms of you want me to say, here's a package of options you should be considering. Otherwise, I give you information and, you know, you can go and, and make that decision. Sure. Okay. Right. And, and then the, the last item, you know, certain line line is who's going to be impacted to what degree? You know, again, we've got to impact certain groups to make this all work. And, you know, I talked about the DDB level, 
But, you know, do we want to, uh, you know, as one group, um, you know, hands off and another group is more. I mean, like I said, we talk about changes to future hires because they're not here. But how palatable some changes to current retirees? How much of an increase can they afford next year? Like, like those are all things that we've got to think about, you know, again, to make this all work long term. Okay. Okay. Uh, and on the next few pages, we, we just got additional questions related to the eligibility, the buyout, just some things for you to consider. Um, for the sake of time, I'm happy to go through them, or we can we can kind of pause there and, and we'll take some questions. Um, you know, the big thing with the, the eligibility plan design is, you know, who's going to be packed to what degree? I kind of, those options I showed you earlier, uh, I categorize those in what I call <laughs> Hubble Rock and Boulder. I mean, and, and then I just kind of group this in terms of what's the impact on the cost? And so if you look at the current retirees, if you want to say, well, you know, we, we want to quote Rock, you know, you could look at either lowering the DDB or limiting spousal coverage. And if you want something that's even more uh, significant, then you can look at eliminating the post-65 or the pre- and post-65. So I'll kind of break those down for you. We can kind of get a feel for, you know, is this a pebble, is this a rock or a boulder? And I understand that anything with current retirees is all boulders, right, because they're going to show up here in the, uh, the woodwork. But mm -hmm. just in terms of categorizing it for your financial impact. On page 30, um, more questions around the buyouts. And we had some of this discussion around, you know, are we worried about affordability and people outliving their money? Are we worried about them spending the money else places? And these are just some questions and then some ideas to kind of guide you as you think about those. These are incredibly, um, these are incredibly responsible adults. I, I, I disagree with some of the comments earlier. We're talking about grown folks who know how to make their own decisions. Yeah. And, and then on, on the pre-funding, again, you know, some of the same questions that, that we talked about with Jeff is, you know, how much a desire to short-term flexibility versus long-term, and then, you know, just thinking about the administrative complexity of, of actually establishing a trust. Mm -hmm. so, so now that I've laid out a bunch of options to you, we talked about the current state, so what's next? Um, what's next is, you know, we want to refine those goals and objectives. You know, the best we can so that, that I could try to help you as best I can in terms of those questions I ask. Once we get answers to those, then I can come up and say, I can package all those options I showed you in the two or three what I call packages. So it may be A, B, or C saying, okay, you told me you want to do these three or four things. Here are three packages that get you there. I mean, in, in our world, you know, there's more than one way to get to a certain number. But, you know, they all have repercussions, but that will be the next stage once we get that. And then it'll just get down to making a, a recommendation. I mean, once I have the goals and objectives, lay out the options, I'm more than willing to say, you know, of these options, based on what you told me, here's what fits you the best. Sure. Absolutely. Eric, yes, sir. One of the things that you didn't discuss is in your presentation here is the investing in a, a trust. And you're saying you're assuming that the trust is earning 4.5%. Yes, sir. I think that's doable in South Carolina with the restrictions on local government investment. I so, so in South Carolina you can only invest in, in fixed income, in my understanding. And, no, and yeah, no equity. if you look at the state, and I, and I got this from the state, the state is assuming like five or something for their investment in trust. They, they invest in. They're their losing money though. I, <laughs> I, no, 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 no. I, 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 no, no, no. I, I'm not. I'm not saying whether or not they're making good investments. All I was just saying was that the state, who's a governing body, is saying that we think long term we could get five percent. In the fixed income market, so so we think four and a half is finding a reasonable point. Now, the state can invest in equity. They they can in, in OPEP. Yes. They uh, they pension pension pension, pension they yeah pension I think they I think OPEP I think is only bond for for in, fixed income. For I don't know about OPEP. Now. I don't know about OPEPs and pensions they can. They we changed that law in yeah. 2006, I guess. Or yeah, so. I'll, I'll send you guys a report. I I, I, I looked sure at their maybe. report. Is it, fixed income. I mean, I think you. I think nationwide might have been about two, two, two point high twos or. or, or well, high I mean, you know, what we're standing right here today, right? Lower environment, fixed income looks really bad. But over the thirty year range, I mean, I, I think you, you probably could, depending on, look at something around that four, four and a half over the thirty years. And what, what I will do, I, I'll send you the state report so you can see what they're doing, and I'll also send you our capital market assumptions for fixed income, so you can see, you know. I'm thinking plain vanilla fixed income is lower, but depending on what you can invest in, you could get up to that four and a half.
I, Teresa, uh, yes, Eric, thank you so much. Very helpful. It's enough Thanks, to, to say grace over. Uh, steps forward, given some of the uh, uh, time frames, we're, we're, we're probably looking mid spring before we make some final decisions. I, I, would, I would think, unless you think we'll do something sooner than that. We were hoping for something sooner than that. I know that Mr. Rickman, who I don't know if he wants to yeah. chime in on this, but he had asked, I think, in one of your previous work sessions for some recommendations. Um, for this topic, and Eric has done a great job of that. I know I gave you a hard time as we were getting prepared for this, Eric, but you did a great job. You prepared me well. You <laughs> <laughs> did a great job. He did a Thank great you. job. But um, as far as plan design changes, um, moving into looking at some of the other options that we've talked about, we were hoping for the next work session, so February 20th, to present those okay. things. I don't know if we're still on that timeline, Mr. We're, we're about two weeks. Okay. But well, you will have solid so, options. So how about two how about two things? Um we gotta work through some scheduling sure. issues. If we're gonna do something work session next time around, let's say some time sensitive issues, we probably just need to do this. I mean yeah. it, we, we, we need to we need to, to drill down into these numbers and yep. the policy mm -hmm. considerations. We also need to have as structured and productive a, a, a form as possible. A discussion with our employees and retirees. Uh, and, uh, obviously, representing the, the, um, the current employees with our retirees, there's there's, there's a conversation to be had there. That, that I think that we, we just need to kind of lay all this information out as, in as informative way as possible. And just have a dialogue that's representative of, of, of all the realities we're dealing with, um, short term and long term, and the opportunities and possibilities. But that, but that needs to be an informed discussion that we we have yet had an opportunity to have at least recently. Sure. Um, uh, Mr. Davis? Just a question. Now, is there a leadership body of, of, the, of the retirees? We, or do we sit in a room with a large group at one? Just wait, we, no, 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 no. I, I think, think we, we are. I think we can pull in. We've had some, we've had some yeah. retirees who have okay. been very helpful okay. and constructive in discussion. I think we, we pull them in. We can figure that out. Um, anybody who wants to misbehave can't be allowed to right. put them out. <laughs> Mr. Rickman, are you doing, are you doing the OPED discussion or are you doing health plan and health, health plan. plan. Well, if you're doing health plan, I've asked for several years now to get the state comparison. Uh, that's the right. For the health plan? Yes. We, got, we got to get an executive session, y'all. Yeah, I'd be glad to, to do that. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you that there are a lot of things in the state plan that are not beneficial for us or the employees because they, they, they have eliminated a lot of the testing, a lot of the drugs, things that we provide our employees today that make our system healthier. So we got to weigh all that out, but yeah, we've looked at it before. Well, I'd like a number. It's not about a number. It's got to be a quality. It's got to be quality. a quality. quality. It's a balance of both. It's not just because if it was just plan. about a number, we could do a lot of things. It's got to be a good plan. It's got to be a good plan. So folks. Keep Mr. our people healthy. Mr. Mayor, just so I'm clear, for the 20th and Mr. Rickman, are you all wanting to bring any of the health care discussion back? Or do you want to dive deeper into this That discussion? won't be ready yet. So let's dive deeper into this. Okay. 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 And have a representative group at the table of the retirees? No. We need, to do, this first. We need to do this self, ourselves first. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Just a minute. Let's, well, let's keep this work to keep the, the endeavor to keep the schedule clear. <clears throat> We got we got some folks. Other thing I would I would just add though for, for the discussion and I think Eric pointed it out a couple times, you know, we focus a lot on the retirees and they're the ones who come and say, Don't take this, don't take that. But you know, our current employees we've got it mm -hmm. we've gotta consider mm -hmm. what impact it has on them and you know, we can't do stuff for the sake of not ticking off our retirees at the detriment to our current employees, people who are working now. I think, I think right now we're just talking about financial considerations, right. not necessarily not quality of I think but I was that's part of the plan. Really. Throw that so, out as part of right, changes and understanding. And that. the reason we had the affordable housing that they tell us trying to get kind of your big broad mm -hmm. and then you like with that mm -hmm. too, you'll need some further recommendations right. to come back on that. So very helpful. Next can we get a motion. Yes. Can we get a motion? Uh, an executive session. So, so moved. Moved. All right, okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh, no, read this. Read it. Read it. And Ms. 
Mr. DeHaul. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Sorry. I make a motion to move to executive session for a discussion of employer, employment of an employee pursuant to 70A2, receipt of legal advice related to matters covered by attorney-client privilege pursuant to 70A2, including the sidewalk vending ordinance, railroad referendum, extended hours permit for commercial establishments. And security measures, sir. Add security measures to that. And four. security measures. Thank you. On number four. Uh, number five is uh, legal advice related to pending, threatened, or potential claims pursuant to 70A2, Cumberland um, versus City of Columbia, discussion of negotiation as to propose contractual arrangement pursuant to 70A2, park repairs, uh, fire services agreement, Lockhart, Bull Street development, discussions related to proposed location or extension of services to encourage the location or expansion of industries or other businesses pursuant to 70A2, rain, living, and project weather. Aye. Right there. Aye. Mr. McDowell? Yes. Mr. Aye. 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 